Welcome to this worship service of the Unitarian Universalist Church in Idaho Falls. My name is Cindy Miller, and I'm your worship associate for today. Victoria McDonald is leading our service today. Whether you're a longtime member or if this is your first time here, we welcome you as you are. We hope that you'll find a message here that inspires you, a message that transforms you, and a loving and caring community that will give meaning to your life. So we have two announcements for today. The first is that the women's group meets on the first Friday, which is November 6th. Watch for an email about that. And the second is that the Philosophical Society will meet on November 19th online. And it's important while we're thinking about it to thank our technical team, Daniel's here today and makes this service possible. So thank you, Daniel. If you have joys, concerns, sorrows, and or milestones that have affected your lives in the recent past and you would like to share that with the congregation, please open the chat box and post them in the chat space provided for you. In this time of COVID and of virtual meetings, we remind you that the church still needs your support. In this spirit, I read this short paragraph by Kayla Parker. We know that our financial contributions to this congregation come from sacrifice and hard work. We're so grateful for this and commit together to ensure the funds that we collect together do a greater good for ourselves and our world than they would have done alone. May there be an offering to sustain and grow the life and mission of this congregation. May we give in love and hope. You can make your contribution by mailing a check to the church at post office box 50376 in Idaho Falls, Idaho, 83405, or by giving to the church's website at idahofallsuu.org and click on the donate button in the connection menu. What is given in love is received with deep gratitude and love. May this congregation be worthy of all your gifts. Pages are sticking together. Okay, so now we're gonna enter into, we hope, the spirit of worship with these thoughts, first said by Jimmy Carter, who signed legislation creating the Frank Church Wilderness in central Idaho. We become not a melting pot, but a beautiful mosaic, different people, different beliefs, different yearnings, different hopes, and different dreams. Please help me ring in this service by becoming present to this space and time, no matter where you are, in the midst of an unrelenting pandemic and a bruising election season. It is important for us to mindfully enter into our sacred space. I will ring our chalice three times, and as I do so, please breathe deeply. As long as you can hear it sound, I invite you to breathe slowly in and then breathe slowly out, and the peace you will feel will bring you into our sacred shared gathering, no matter where we are physically located. In this spirit, please enjoy the prelude hymn.
Please join me now in the reading of the Church's Covenant. Love is the spirit of this community and service its law. And this is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Victoria will now light our chalice, symbol of Unitarian Universalism, to illuminate these brief thoughts by Forrest Church, son of Frank Church and a UU minister. Want what you have, do what you can, and be who you are. Good morning, my name is Victoria McDonald, and I also am a worship associate from October through March, and then I return to the Alaskan rainforest. My topic today deals with an Idaho politician, Frank Forrester Church III, a man who makes me proud to be born in Idaho. In these dark days of realizing that some political leaders have difficulty discerning fact from fiction, Frank, For Frank Church III was able to search and find the truth. He had his share of bad luck, but also good luck. A strong marriage to Bethine Clark, an Idaho Falls girl, as my mother referred to her, and he left us a stellar record in the Senate during the dark days of Vietnam and the Nixon presidency. Frank Church left us a great legacy, legacy of honesty. In the past four years, we have had to deal with a tremendous amount of dishonesty, and we do not know where we'll be on November 4th. Even so, we can never abandon hope for those who are presently working for justice and the future women and men who stand to defend our rights. Today's Time for All Ages is about Polly Murray using pictures from Imagination Station, exploring the tra trailblazing life of Polly Murray. The illustrations are by Deborah Fitzgerald. Polly Murray was born in 1910. Orphaned at a young age, she grew up in North Carolina, raised by her Aunt Pauline in the home of her grandparents. She taught herself to read by age five and read voraciously. She qualified to attend the North Carolina College for Negroes, but refused to attend because she refused to participate in segregated activities. As a child, she walked miles across town rather than take the segregated streetcars and avoided movies rather than sit in the balcony where blacks were required to sit. 
Instead of applying to the North Carolina College for Negroes, she insisted that her aunt take her to New York City so she could apply to Columbia University. This is where she learned that her life was constrained not only by race, but also by her gender. Denied admission to Columbia because she was a woman, unable to attend Barnard College because the tuition was too high, Polly persuaded her family to let her live with a cousin in New York City so she could establish residency there while taking the high school classes she needed to have to attend Hunter College, a women's college, for free. She was in college when the Depression hit. She did manage to graduate from college, but it was very difficult, and then she drifted in and out of poverty from one dead-end job to another. Returning to North Carolina, she found herself... refusing to move to the back of the bus. Working to keep a black man off death row, she met Eleanor Roosevelt, who became a lifelong friend. Polly also met some lawyers who persuaded her to attend law school at Howard University. Howard was a black university, so segregation was no longer a problem, but she was the only woman in law school, and none of the men could understand why she was there. While at Howard University, she had a radical idea. Instead of trying to end separate but equal segregation by arguing that separate facilities were unequal, what if the argument was that separate facilities should not be separate in the first place? She made a bet with her professor, Spotswood Robinson, that the case establishing separate but equal would be overturned within 10 years. She won that bet when Mr. Robinson successfully argued Brown versus Board of Education using Polly's reasoning. She spent the rest of her life working for women's rights, a co-founder of the National Organization for Women. When she was almost 70, she decided to become an Episcopal priest and was the first black woman to be ordained an Episcopal priest. Polly struggled her whole life with the concept of gender, coping with frequent mental breakdowns because she felt she was a man in a woman's body but unable to find a doctor to help her transition. The end. We now dedicate time to our joys, concerns, sorrows, and any milestones, a time to share with this religious community events that have affected our lives in the recent past and to speak for those we want to hold in our thoughts. I will now read your joys, concerns, and sorrows while Victoria lights a candle. If you have any, they should be in the chat box to the right of your screen. I have just one right now. It's from Victoria McDonald. She talk, it's a joy. It's a joy. She talked to Hank Boland, and she and Jim are doing well at Fairwind's retirement. And she sends her love to all of you. Do you have any more? Okay. So we will light the last candle to lift up the joys and concerns as well as the ones that remain in the silence of our hearts. Now we have a hymn.
Frank Forrester Church III, Idaho Senator from 1956 through 1980, 24 years, was on the edge of my politi political awareness as a young woman, but I have been fascinated about him because an Idaho wilderness area was renamed in his honor. My knowledge of church is based on one book, Fighting the Odds, 617 pages long, detailing his life. In addition to his work for wilderness preservation, he dealt with executive privilege, military overspending, and he worked to protect seniors and the non-wealthy, which I think is about 97% of us. There isn't enough time to describe his many political involvements, so I have chosen things that are relevant to me, events that are relevant to me. Frank Church was descended from the Englishman Richard Church, who in 1630 disembarked in Boston. <clears throat> Excuse me. Richard married Elizabeth Warren, whose father had sailed on the Mayflower. The family continued living on the East Coast until 1872, when Frank Church I moved from Maine to Idaho. President Grover Cleveland placed Frank Church I in charge of the U.S. Assay Office, where the purity of metal is tested. And one of their children, Frank Forrester Church II, married Laura Bilderback, a second-generation Idahoan. Frank and Laura, middle-class Catholic Republicans, which was the party of Lincoln, had two sons, Richard and Frank Forrester Church III, who was born in 1924. Laura, their mother, was warm and protective, their father remote. However, both parents taught their children perseverance, frugality, and honesty. Father Frank wanted both sons to attend Catholic school, but Frank, our Frank, had been bullied while attending and insisted on transferring to public school. There he flourished and was known to be a quick learner, well-behaved, and intellectually curious. As a young boy, he was fascinated by words, how they sounded, and their nuances. His love of language was evident when he spoke, and at the age of 17, in 1941, competing against 108,000 other students, won the American Legion National High School Oratorical Contest. All students had prepared a speech titled, a free and equal society is inevitable in America. But young church warned of the dangers of economic monopolies and the inevitable abuse of power. But also in 1941, Frank was fo focused on Bethine Clark, the Democratic governor's daughter. Bethine's family came from Idaho Falls where her father Chase Clark had been mayor, but they moved to Boise upon his election. Governor Clark served only one term, but in that environment, Bethine developed a shrewd understanding of politics. Our future senator left the Republican Party after learning about the Democratic focus on the common people and their struggles. Politically, he tended toward isolationism following Senator Boris' lead until Pearl Harbor on December 7th. Graduating from high school, he had earned a $4,000 scholarship to Stanford, but he only attended two quarters, enlisting in the Army from 1942 until the end of the war. In 1947, he was one of seven chosen from a pool of 400 who were admitted to OCS, the Officer Candidate School, at Fort Benning, Georgia. Church disliked the military with its hierarchical structure, but he felt a responsibility to his country. After leaving OCS, he was sent to China and realized that that country was on the brink of an upheaval with out-of-control inflation, scarce commodities, and a thriving black market. He learned that the Chinese communists had fought the Japanese brilliantly during the war, and they used ingenuity and discipline. But he also recognized that European colonialism was doomed. In addition, he was aware of the, quote, unprecedented imperialism, unquote, as U.S. corporations expanded into foreign labor markets. 
And although Frank and Bethine had written faithfully during the war, their romance had faltered. So he returned to Stanford, graduating with great distinction as a political science major. Frank returned to Idaho, where he and Bethine recognized their bond and decided to marry in the Salmon River Mountains, now enclosed in the Frank Church River of No Return Wilderness. He and Bethine moved to Boston, where he enrolled in Harvard Law School while Bethine worked at the Radcliffe Library. However, neither liked the Northeastern United States, so he enrolled at Stanford to complete his law degree. On September 23, 1948, Frank Forrester Church IV was born, who Cindy's already introduced, and he was nicknamed Twig. Like, life looked promising for the family until February of 49, while undergoing hernia surgery, Church's doctors discovered testicular cancer, deemed to be incurable. However, a week later, another doctor concluded that diagnosis to be incorrect and suggested radiation. After seven weeks of treatments, the Church family returned to Idaho to recover. After the summer's rest, Church returned to Stanford and in 1950 earned his law degree. The family returned to Idaho and in 1951 he opened his own law office in Boise. Now the Democratic Party in Idaho at that time was weak. But Frank and a friend, Carl Burke, invigorated the party, and Church was elected head of the Idaho Young Democrats. Joining other liberals in the United States, Church believed the Cold War was caused by the communists, and he had forgotten what he had learned in China. But he enjoyed being in Idaho with family and friends and gaining a foothold in politics. In 1956, Church ran for the Senate, and using the new technology of TV ads and old-fashioned grassroots campaigning, assisted as always by Bethine, he defeated Herman Welker. Church was 32 years old, the youngest senator in American history, with very little political experience. But 1956 was a year of liberal resurgence as the food stamp and the school lunch programs began in the nation. Church also advocated for the separation of church and state, worked to pass the ERA and expand social security benefits, but condemned the right to work policies as, quote, the right to wreck. He also supported the Supreme Court's 1954 desegregation law, Brown v. Board of Education. By 1957, Senator Church had formulated his political strategy. He looked for the middle ground, compromise, and building coalitions. The Senate at that time gave legislators time to debate and reach a reasonable decision. Now, Frank was easygoing, tolerant, witty, and good-natured but not all the senators agreed with him. Church supported the admission of Alaska, which had been blocked because the Senate feared liberal Alaskan Democrats, and that's really not a worry anymore. Hawaii had also been blocked since many residents were non-white, which Church recognized as racist. And in 1957, the Church family was joined by Chase, nicknamed Spud, and unlike some politicians, Church was determined to maintain family ties. Bethine was often in his office and was judged to be too visible. But the senator depended upon her judgment. He described Bethine as his closest friend, advisor, and political partner. During the 50s, the U.S., the United Kingdom, and the Soviet Union performed 63 nuclear atmospheric tests. When Church was appointed to the Foreign Relations Committee, he opposed the ongoing nuclear weapons test and proposed a limited atmospheric test ban. ban. Although criticized for compromising, Church believed that first steps need to be taken as a way toward the final goal of a total ban. But our senator's most significant work was protection of natural resources. But at first, Church leaned toward the development of resources. But within a few years, he advocated for a rational policy to establish a national wilderness preservation system. 
Although being a conservation was and is politically dangerous in Idaho, Church boldly stated, wilderness is not a renewable resource. And he worked behind the scenes for a wilderness bill. When campaigning for re-election in 1962, Church convinced Idahoans that habitat protection was reasonable and that preservation of wildlands protected fishing, hunting, and recreational areas. In 1964, the Wilderness Bill passed the Senate 78 to 8, a remarkable achievement for a 40-year-old senator, and it demonstrated his perseverance and ability to deal with Republicans. Many people were involved in creating the Wilderness Act, but Church was its spokesman. Wilderness is defined as an area of undeveloped federal land retaining its primeval character without permanent improvements or human habitation. Wilderness is managed so as to preserve its natural condition. It is open to traditional indigenous use or low-impact recreation, and it must have at least 5,000 acres of land. In the 1960s, the U.S. became involved in the Southeast Asian conflict. Church visited Laos and Vietnam, led by Diem, who had gained American support by telling the U.S. he was fighting communism, although actually Vietnam was rejecting colonialism. But the U.S. government had fallen sway under the domino theory, But Senator Church stayed firm and regarded the U.S. presence as a catastrophe. In in 1963, as anti-war protests continued, Church worried about street demonstrations, saying, quote, they are taking politics out of formal government channels and into the streets, unquote. Nevertheless, some of his staff joined the protests along with 14-year-old Forrest. On June 11, 1963, a 73-year-old Buddhist monk immolated himself, protesting the war. Diem's troops harassed Buddhists, and two months later, two more monks and a nun had self-immolated. Government forces raided Buddhist temples and arrested hundreds. These events horrified the American public, and one U.S. advisor who was not named in that book recommended an honorable withdrawal, but the U.S. felt it was fighting communism. And after the Kennedy assassination in November of 63, Church believed that extremist hysteria was ripping the nation apart as we stumbled into war. Church's 1968 campaign was difficult, but he was re-elected despite George Hansen's smears. And I have a poster of one of Church's re-election campaigns that I have saved. I keep it hung up in the stairway, just to remind me. And if you noted, all the apostrophes were used correctly. The John Birch, I noticed, the John Birch Society was broadcasting alarmist reports that Church was pro-communist since he fought for labor unions and working men and women. But Church insisted that government regulations existed to protect the public from concentrated economic power. But Nixon was elected president in 1968, and Church immediately criticized Nixon's foreign policy as, quote, compulsive intervention conducted on a global scale that dictated an ever larger military budget, unquote, much like the Soviet Union. While campaigning, Church spoke to different groups, recommending a quick as exit as a, quote, victory of principle over delusion and that Saigon does not stand guard over Seattle, unquote. But the war continued, as did nationwide protests. Senator Church was increasingly frustrated over the U.S. reliance on military solutions, and he railed against Nixon's, quote, imperial presidency, unquote, and the persistent inequalities in our nation. 
He remained always suspicious of natural resource developers. He defended the rights of the elderly and pushed for a 15% increase in Social Security benefits, which finally brought seniors' income above the poverty line. Church believed that poverty could be abolished if military spending was lessened. President Nixon was attempting to stifle opposition and ordered the Justice Department to stop the New York Times from publishing the Pentagon Papers. Nixon hoped to centralize executive authority using secrecy and deception while ignoring the Constitution. After the Watergate while Watergate break-in was exposed, Church believed that the scandals facilitated congressional reassertion of authority. As a member of the Foreign Relations Committee, he discovered how U.S. multinational corporations blocked Allende's presidency in Chile and eventually led to his murder. And during the Arab oil embargo, Church chastised the oil company's willingness to profit from U.S. consumers' need for reasonable oil prices. While campaigning for his third term in 1974, the John Birch Society again proclaimed that Church was a pro-communist liberal, but he was re-elected due to his successful grassroots campaign, Always with Bethine. I was teaching second grade in Salmon, Idaho, and during the 4th of July parade, Frank and Bethine rode past in a horse-drawn buggy down Main Street. I waved and cheered, but did not realize what a courageous person he was. 1975 was dubbed the year of intelligence when both houses of Congress appointed committees to investigate wrongdoing in our intelligence agencies. Church was chairman of what became known as the Church Committee that invested, investigated abuses of the CIA, the NSA, National Security Agency, the FBI, and the IRS. But in the meantime, the South Vietnamese government collapsed. President Ford requested $722 million in emergency military assistance, which Church vehemently resisted. After years of work building a coalition, the Central Idaho Wilderness Act passed in 1980, forming the largest wilderness in the lower 48. Not only were huge swaths of land protected in Idaho, many other states, set, such as Alaska, set aside significant tracts of land. And as the year was passed, more people recognized the wisdom of environmental protection. However, with Reagan's election in 1980, Church was defeated, and he later surmised that, quote, people are like geraniums, and it's best if they are uprooted and repotted in different soil, unquote. He joined a D.C. law firm and finally had time to lecture, write, and earn considerably more money than his $60,000 salary as a senator. Thereafter, Church avoided the Senate and did not use his former connections to his advantage. Unfortunately, his health began to fail. He developed diabetes and in 1984 was designated with pancreatic cancer. He died April 7th at the age of 59. However, the designated, the redesignated Frank Church River of No Return Wilderness Area was renamed three weeks before his death while he was still conscious. He is buried in Boise's Morris Hill Cemetery, a short distance from the grave of William Bora. One of my favorite uh, church quotes is, All conduct that brings us dishonor must, in the long run, fail. So take heart. There are honorable politicians, and hopefully we might vote in a few more. And we're now going to sing our Idaho state song that Jessica was able to cobble the chords together. So I hope you enjoy it. It's a lovely song.
First, thanks to those who helped me pull this service together. I was a little bit nervous about a month ago. Reverend Kevin answered my questions calmly. Jessica was excited to play the hymns and our state song. Cindy Miller cheerfully agreed to be the worship associate. Elizabeth Cogliotti found a book about a woman who lived a courageous, difficult life. Devette Bogart assisted by pulling information together. Annette Lovell held my virtual hand, and the tech crew, starring Daniel Schwen, made difficult things look easy. But my special thanks go to Senator Frank Church, who played by the rules, dealt honestly with those of differing points of view, and left us, Idahoans, and the rest of the world with an unequaled wilderness area. Please join me in the reading of the words for extinguishing our chalice flame, which are printed in the order of service. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And please enjoy our postlude. <laughs> 